to, uh, I'm going to speak to you tonight regarding vision, obviously. And when I say vision, I in the Bible included mean a few different things. It's not limited to uh, the prophet Joel or the apostle Peter when, when they say that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy uh, and all that sort of thing. It's not limited to that type of vision. Uh, we might touch on that a little bit. Um, but tonight we're going to do things entirely different because what I would like to do is give you a thought or two that is entirely practical enough for you to apply it in a way that it really will change your life. So as a younger church, we, we touched on this topic to some small degree um, before, but in considering some things that God has been speaking to me here lately, um, we're going to touch on it again here tonight. So Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Amen. Now, what I'm not going to do tonight is uh, speak on natural vision, meaning the things that you see with your own natural eyes. We're not going to talk about that. Um, the vision I'm going to speak about tonight is, of course, supernatural vision, simply meaning an above natural type of vision. When we hear the word supernatural, we automatically start thinking about spirits and some of us even ghosts and whatever other kind of weird things we might be thinking. But um, the word supernatural ultimately just means uh, above natural, greater than natural, more than natural. So uh, we're going to look at supernatural type vision. And in doing so, I want to touch on two different kinds, and these are the two different kinds. I don't know if you have a notepad and pen, but I will say a few things that you probably want to want to be able to reference, and uh, uh, you don't have to go back on the video or have something to write with. One type of vision I want to touch on, obviously, is the uh, vision given by the Spirit of God, and that's the you know the kind that we're familiar with when we think of vision and we think of Scripture. That's the, that's our go-to typically, especially. As full gospel people, we hear vision, we imagine something God has shown us by pouring out his spirit, like unto a dream, but not quite a dream. So that's, that's really what we think of when we hear vision. So I do want to touch on that some, but also, and maybe more specifically, because this is the one that's going to ultimately impact your day-to-day, -day, everyday life, all the time. And it's uh, vision developed through setting the mind, putting the mind in a certain place, and developing a target, if you will, a vision. And it's not just an uh, empty uh, throw it out there wherever you will kind of vision. It is, uh, if you will, maybe a co-mingled, God-inspired vision that has given you a trajectory for your life uh, and for the end result of the thing. So I do want to at least touch on those two in some sense. Now, the greatest context of the word vision here in this text, simply put, speaks of divine revelation, obviously. Um, but it's a spiritual dream or revelation but beyond that, it's more in a broad sense. It's a mental estate in which you're able to see beyond what the natural eyes can see. It's uh, in the Hebrew, let me just read to you the definition. It simply means mental sight, a dream, a revelation, or an oracle. Now, in every sense of the word, it's speaking of sight in which goes beyond the, the, the realm of the conscious mind. It's being able to see in a spiritual sense beyond what these two eyes can see. Now that's important not just for the, the reason of God giving you a supernatural vision, typically of things to come, but it's important for every aspect of your life. It's important for your family. It's important for your church. Uh, it's important for your finances. It's important for your job. It's important to develop and have a uh, God-supported vision that enables you to see into an end result, a targeted result beyond what you're able to uh, comprehend now in a natural sense. Does that make sense? So in other words, a vision in and of itself can be a dream, a revelation, a mental image of something unseen. And I'm going to try to give you this as simply as I can. Uh, and where this sort of vision is, now hear me closely, uh, be it in your church or your family or your job or your finances or your relationships or whatever else, uh, wherever that type of vision is absent, then these things will eventually have a failing end. Uh, everything must have a vision. And I'm going to be honest right now before I go any further just as a church. When we moved here, we had mapped out the leadership discussed it. I even have bullet points. I have it in, on a notepad of, of a mission, a vision, a trajectory for the church. Why? Because without it, you perish. Amen. And I do believe we've gone through at least a number of weeks without giving enough attention to that. And we will visit that as a church, um, what that looks like and what we believe it should look like. And speaking of, we need to 
we need to chat regarding some things, the leadership, regarding some things. There's nobody else in leadership over there. He's looking around. <laughs> We need to talk about some things about the future of the church because I've had some ideas. I do believe they're from the Lord. And because of those ideas, I've had a number of people, some of them are money banks, that want to support us in the possibility of what I'm thinking. Hallelujah. And uh, it could be a big deal. <laughs> so we need to talk about that. Uh, it could be a challenge. But what's a challenge when you're reaping a reward for Christ? Right. So... A vision in its most simplest definition is the ability to see into something that is otherwise unseeable uh, in such a way that it, it forces you to hang on to hope and even more so to develop a passion that will drive you to pursue that vision in spite of all opposition in order for you to obtain it. When I think about uh, God-given visions of rapture, that sort of thing, for example, when God pours out His Spirit, He gives us a supernatural vision, maybe of the end times, or just you name it, whatever it is God may give a vision of. Um, ultimately, the purpose of that is not just to uh, say, hey, here's a vision, enjoy. That's not really the point. God has purpose for what He does. Right. Um, so, almost always, when God gives a vision, it's for the purpose of putting a target right before your face. To say, look at this, uh, dig your heels in and pursue this, uh, drive this thing in that direction, let that motivate you, let it give you hope, let it put a passion within you. I'm showing you this so that you can have a fuel, a fire fuel within your heart. I'm showing you this so that you've got something to aim for, something to continue to look at as you press on. I'm showing you this so it will motivate you and keep you on course. So I want to take it beyond that and tell you that that applies to your relationships just the same. That applies to your marriage. It applies to your finances. I promise you, if you're not content with your finances right now, then you need a vision for your finances. And you need a goal and a target and a vehicle as to how you're going to obtain that, that, that vision. Without it, you'll perish. There's, there's little to no chance you're going to see it fall in your lap. You've got to have a vision. You've got to have something to aim for. So, I want you to think about Jesus. He had, he had a clear vision. He had a clear revelation of why it was that he became a man and came into the earth to do what it was that he did. And because he had a clear vision, if you will, and was able to see the unseen, you can see it in his life, that because of that, he was able to fulfill the will of God perfectly and effectively with a passion. He understood the reason that he came. He had a, a vision, if you will, uh, of why it was that he was in the earth. Uh, some of us presuppose, I guess, that because uh, Jesus was the word that became flesh and that he had, uh, had glory before the foundation of the earth with the Father, that because of this, that he understood uh, in every sense everything going on in his life. And I promise you, he had to learn, just like you and I have to learn. Amen. There's things that the Bible show us that, look, let me tell you, when the centurion soldier, when Jesus recommended to go to his house and lay hands on the sick or whatever else, he's like, no, no, I'm not worthy to have you in my house. He made that recommendation, not knowing in his humanity that the man was going to say, no, no, let's not do that. But I'm, just, I'm saying that because there's things that Christ, even in his humanity, had to, to learn. He had to learn obedience, the Bible says. He had to learn. He went to school as a child. There's things he learned. There's things that he had to grow into and understand. So the fact that Christ had a vision at least and an understanding of what his purpose was and his mission in the earth was to such a degree he was able to go into it and, and fulfill it to its highest degree and not fail at any point and honor God along the way and to do it with a passion and, and a purpose behind it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. So the point of a vision, the idea of a vision, not just if it's God-given, dropped in your spirit for the sake of showing you end times events or whatever else, but a vision for your family, your finances, your job, your whatever else is vital to keep you from seeing destruction before the end result comes to pass. The idea of the vision is ultimately to give you a target that births hope within you and a passion within you to pursue that until it does come to pass. Because how many of you know that often when you fire at a target, you don't immediately hit that target. There is time between and in like manner, like when you run a race, you run, but you don't get to the end until you run. There's, there's time in between the start and the fulfillment of the vision. And a lot of us give up hope in between where we start and where we should finish because we don't have a vision. That's the point. Without a vision, without that set in place, the people perish. 
So there's a lot said. And I'm taking you somewhere. I'm going to give you some really weird things that you wouldn't think would come from a pulpit, but I just I don't care. I'm going to give you things that help you. Um, there's a lot of things in respect to uh, goal setting in the world. There's books, there's classes, there's that kind of thing. You'll see a lot of that. And in fact, you'll see whole churches built upon that. And that's just not good. Um, but there are a lot of things, and a lot of it's probably good about, you know, the value of a vision and that sort of thing. In fact, uh, some of it is probably helpful. But at the end of the day, it brings us back full circle to the temple of God. And there's some things I want to say before I go any further in that respect. Your capacity to see with the visionary eyes, whether speaking of revelation from God or a vision that was developed by setting your mind in its place, all take place in the supernatural or beyond natural realm. Amen. So the temple is triune. You're made in the similitude of God, the spirit, soul, body. That's something we should know here. Pretty concrete. Um, now, you've got the body. It is of the natural realm, if you will. But then you've got the soul and you've got the spirit, both of which are of the supernatural realm. They're both of another realm greater than this natural realm. Um, the soul and the spirit, which are ultimately of one compartment divided by a curtain, um, exist in a realm that's greater than that of this natural realm. All three of those realms are connected. Your body, your soul, and your spirit are connected. There's a unity there. There's connection there. Um, so I say that for this reason. The health of your temple is ultimately going to impact the clarity of your ability to see with visionary eyes. Amen. The unity that takes place, spirit, soul, body, whether or not your eye is single in the manner that Christ was speaking of, is going to impact your ability to see with visionary eyes. Why does that matter? Because without a vision, people perish. Amen. So by necessity, the only realm in the body that can receive, formulate, or even see with the visionary eye is the realm of the mind and of the spirit. That's the only realm that can see with the visionary eye. Your natural eyes can't do it. This, this body in and of itself cannot do it. It's what's within, what's housed within this body that has the ability to see with the visionary eye. Now, if you're lost, stay with me. I'm going to take you down a very, very simple road. Now, listen. If you're the temple of God, this will be practical. So be, this is going to be uh, difficult to understand. I'm going to try to drag through in a way that is so simple. If you're the temple of God and you are triune and two of your three realms are designed to function in some manner in the supernatural realm and experience the visionary realm that God has designed you to experience, then we would be willingly ignorant if we believed that the functioning components of our bodies were irrelevant to our spiritual health and ability to live spiritual lives. If there's a connection between all three realms, then we've got to understand that all three realms play a part in our ability to tap into and experience these type of things. And again, I'm not just talking about God depositing a supernatural vision. I'm talking about you having the the subconscious faculties working within your mind to be able to develop a vision that's legit and obtainable and to be able to develop a vision in this life, in your day-to-day -day life, that brings you from glory to glory out of the dust into a realm that is otherwise not achievable. So with that said, uh, or rather with that in mind, <laughs> I want to challenge you to consider a thought, and I, I do also encourage you to take notes. Because what I want to share here tonight is going to be a practical, uh, basic, biblical slash even scientific explanation and application that can help you develop in your visionary health. Because again, without, without the vision, the people perish. You need to function in vision in your mind and in your spirit. So what I want to do is give you some things that will help you uh, function in that in a more healthy way rather than just toss you theological nuggets and just leave them there on your plate and expect you to figure out how to consume it. Most of you will walk away from it and never consume it at all. Um, so I want to address some things. I'm going to start here. 
The mind, where is it seated? Is it in your hip? Is it in your knee? Or are the 101s of, of all of creation, is, is it the brain? <laughs> it's the brain. So the brain is key to what I'm fixing to tell you. Why? Because you're the temple. The physical body is going to be important as it impacts the mind. And the physical part of what's attached to the mind obviously is the brain. So I want to speak more specifically beyond the mind toward the brain. Because if you can address some things in the brain, you're going to address some things in the mind. And if you can address some things in the mind, this is going to help you. I promise this is going to help you. So in the brain, I know this is strange, but I'm telling you, you I'm going to give you a couple things that you can practice when you go home. And if you practice these things, you're going to see a total turnaround in your spiritual welfare. You're going to see a lot of things change. And it's very, it's so practical, it's not even funny. So in the brain, you've got ultimately five types of brain waves. Um, and you're seeing those things, th those are functioning and active in your, in your brain at all times. Um, you've got beta waves. <coughs> You've got alpha waves. You've got theta waves. That's a TH. You've got delta waves and even gamma, which is not important what I'm fixing to tell you. But I want you to think about something. Statistics say that your average person opens uh, social media 150 times a day. First of all, that's terrible. <laughs> that is not good. Um, but I need you to hear me out. If the first thing that we do when we get out of the bed is, is open social media, pick up Facebook, go through Instagram, or whatever in the world else it is that we do, then that's going to present a number of problems for you, not only uh, but a number of problems for you that you've probably never considered in the spiritual realm. That's presenting some things to you, and I'm going to give you a perspective and a reason why that's probably never crossed your mind. I'm going to tell you if what I'm fixing to tell you does not matter. And I have to wonder whether or not how well you live for Christ matters because this does impact that. Now, I'm going to give you a few details before I go any further. And it's this. Out of the five brain waves, there's really only four that are primary uh, in your function and what's important what I'm fixing to tell you. So again, you've got the beta waves. And in the beta waves, that is what we are operating in ultimately right now. That's the, the conscious, we're awake, we're aware. That's the beta wave. That's where we are now. The next, you've got the delta waves. And these are the waves you experience when you're in a deep sleep. Listen, <laughs> I feel like I don't know why I'm having to reiterate this, but maybe it's because somebody's like, why am I hearing this right now? I'm telling you, you are the temple of God. If your body is the outer court, if it's the temple, then the things that happen in your body, in your organs, and everything that's a part of the body have something to do with the temple. And it's impacting the holy place and the holiest of holies. It's impacting your ability to function in spiritual things. So I'm rewinding, and I'm addressing in a very specific way what goes on in the body. And I want to do that for the purpose of you being able to develop in spiritual things in a way that it totally changes your life. And beyond that, if, if you're somebody that's had a hard time maintaining your cognitive abilities, I'm fixing to tell you some things that will help strengthen that. So, again, the beta waves, that's what we're ultimately experiencing now, unless you're zoning out and you're falling into a trance or something. And some of you may be. It's kind of warm and I'm boring. Um, <laughs> some of you might be going into another realm now. But right now, most of us are functioning in ultimately beta waves. We're aware. We're awake. That is your beta. The delta is when you're in a deep sleep and uh, you, you're gone. You're out in another world. And so that's what's going on in the delta waves now. But in between those two waves are two that I want to specifically mention, and it's this with intention. It's going to be your alpha and your theta waves, and this is why. Um, theta is the state of ultimately being in and out. It's that middle ground. It's that place uh, that a lot of people know is the visionary realm. It's the creative state of mind. It's, uh, it's where you are when you develop ideas, a lot of folks say that a shower can induce theta waves, that you can get into that place and zone out and just begin to enter into a visionary state. And I don't know if I've ever really been in that zone, but I, I do notice there's at least a difference in the shower. Um, but the alpha waves, and I find it interesting that this is true about alpha, because what did Jesus say? He says, I am the alpha and the omega. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting because the alpha uh, wave is the state of accelerated learning. 
it's a uh, it's a state of relaxed awareness. It's it's kind of the place you really ought to be entering into a mixture of alpha and theta, if you will, when you enter into a Christian type of meditation. I say that because this is why the Bible speaks on a hundred occasions about meditation. And I'm not speaking about what you see people do when they cross their legs and they circle their fingers and they sit before Buddha. That's not what I'm talking about. What they're doing is emptying their mind and they're allowing anything and everything to come in and, and overtake their mind. That is not what the Bible means when it uses Man. the word meditation. If it ever uses the word meditation, it is speaking more of a focused uh, fixing of the mind. And it is, you enter into a realm of stillness. So, uh, sadly, you can observe a form of alpha waves if you come to my house uh, when I get off work pretty much any time and you see the kids watching a cartoon. So you'll come in and you'll shout in their ear and they're still like zombies, they're gone. It's like they don't even hear you. Why? Because they've entered into a, a realm of alpha waves. They're consumed, they're saturated by it. I can sit and I can shout at them and they're just, they don't hear me. And I'm gonna tell you that's problematic because it's in that place of alpha and theta waves that ultimately mold and form your visionary life. <laughs> and there they are like zombies sitting in front of who knows what being formed and molded by it. It's more than them being tuned in and out of this world. They really are being molded by that in that moment. It's dangerous. Amen. So if you got them sitting in front of the Ninja Turtles, you say, well, it's not that bad. Well, it really is that bad because they're foul-mouthed and they're not Christ-like. And they're, they're zoned in to something that is molding them, even if it seems innocent, in a way that's legit and it's changing their, their spiritual uh, it's, it's changing them in a spiritual matter. Amen. So what's my point? If you want to train people, now listen to me, I'm, I'm, I promise I'm trying to help you. If you want to train folks to absorb information better or more efficiently, then what, what we need to do first is teach them how to get to an alpha or theta state of mind. It's important, and let me tell you this, I always say it because people go to school, they will fail, they'll drop out, they do terrible, but here's the truth. When, if you were to take that same schoolwork and put it to music and then let them listen, then they will learn the whole thing A to Z and not, not miss a point. Why? Because that music is bringing them into a certain wave around in their mind. And because of it, they're able to achieve what they couldn't otherwise achieve. So I'm saying that for this reason. When you go to school, they teach you how to read. They teach you how to learn. They teach you how to write. They teach you how to think. They teach you all these things, but they don't teach you how to retain they don't teach you how to remember. They don't teach you how to recall. They don't teach you any of those type of things. It's said that within two days of the time that you've heard something, even now, right now what I'm telling you, that 80% of that is lost within the first 48 hours, that you might walk out of this building after hearing what I said and, and leave 80% of it in this seat and then walk out and then never hear it again or never remember it again. And that's problematic. And ultimately, it's because we're hearing from the wrong place. And this is what's happening when we're going into prayer. You say, why does this matter? When we go into prayer, this is the same issue. We go into prayer. We, we, we don't understand the brain. We don't understand the realms of the spirit. We don't understand how to maximize um, what God has given us in order to produce the desired end. And therefore, we, most of us go into prayer and we walk out. We've not heard the voice of God. We've not had a spiritual encounter. We've not developed a vision. And therefore, we walk away and we perish. Not obviously perish in body, but we perish because we've not walked away with anything that's beneficial. So what I want to do tonight is speak to you in a way that's going to help you. Remember, uh, Solomon says, without a vision, the people perish. And I'll read it to you out of the New King James. Just so you hear how it's worded. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, meaning that if people don't know what to do, they'll either do anything at all or they'll do it their own way, which is a problem. They'll, they'll either not do anything or they'll try and figure it out themselves if they don't know what to do. And I, I need you to hear me out. You're only ever going to be what you see, but you'll never be what you cannot see. Did you hear what I'm saying? You're only ever going to step into what you see, but you'll never step into what you don't see. You can become what you behold, but what you do not behold, you cannot come. In other words, your vision is going to determine your destiny. It determines the outcome of your life. That's why the Bible tells us to affirm continually the promises of God to fix our mind on things above and on things beneath, to position our mind in a certain place so that it has the ability to be found in a realm that can receive from God. 
Uh, I'm telling you, you cannot just passively step into the presence of God and receive from God and hear from God and see with a vision. You've got to be deliberate and understanding of it. So what I'm going to do here tonight by telling you what I'm telling you is give you a couple of practical things that will help you to understand there are high times during the day. There are, uh, there are key points uh, in your life, points in time in your life that if you will utilize those while you can, it's going to help you to become a visionary person. You'll start hearing from God better. You'll start seeing what God would have you to see better. And it's going to change your life. Amen. So when I was first saved, and I'm just going to give you a few points, and then I'll get into the point. When I was first saved, um, I remember telling somebody who's still probably not saved today. They say they are, but I'm just not sure. One of those. I remember telling them when I was first saved that uh, I said, one day I'm going to heal the sick. I read the book, and I felt it burning in my heart. I, I had developed already a, a vision that one day this is what I'm going to do. I didn't know I already could. But to me, it was a vision. It was something to obtain and to pursue. I knew that it was going to be a reality for me one day. I told them, I said, one day I'm going to heal the sick. They laughed. They mocked me. They thought it was funny. So three, four, five years passes, and looking back, uh, not only are people getting healed, they're getting healed. Uh, not only are our folks getting touched by the Lord, but this vision that I had set became a reality because I pursued it. Because the vision was God-given, it was there. God showed me that, look, this is your lot. This is what I would have for you. I want you walking in that. I want you laying hands on folks. I want them recovering. This is for you. Because God deposited that vision in my heart, it gave me enough fuel and enough passion to pursue it and to seek it and to drive toward it. If I had no vision, then I'm going around aimlessly hoping for the best. But God had showed me that this is for you. This is a fact. Now you pursue it. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And because I had a vision, I didn't fall short. I didn't go to the right or to the left. I didn't perish halfway there. I was able to pursue it until I began to walk in it because I had a vision. Amen. You understand? So I'll take you back to the brain waves. <clears throat> if you wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, remember, there's beta, that's us right now. There's delta, sound asleep. There's theta and there's alpha. Um, the theta waves, that's your visionary waves, ultimately. The alpha is the, the concentrated, the deep learning. It's, it's those things. But there's a combo of both when you're asleep. When you're asleep, you're active in, in high gear, theta waves and even alpha waves. They're moving and, and shaking and doing things that just simply aren't happening while you're awake. So when you first wake up, your brain is still functioning in alpha and theta waves the instant your eyes open. What do most of us do? We roll over, we grab that phone, we unlock it, we see three red dots on the Facebook thing, we open it, we go in, we see what the comment was. Some of us get offended because they didn't agree with my post, or I have a text message from a coworker saying the truck's broke down, you know, blah, blah, blah. What has it done? I'm gonna tell you what that's done. What that's done is it's, 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 it's forming my spiritual mind, why? Because I'm still in theta and alpha waves when I first wake up. When I first get out of the bed, I'm still in that position of theta and alpha. That's the visionary state. It's the place to where I can tap into the supernatural more easily than I ever could three or four hours after being up and going about my day. When I, if I get up and the first thing I do is I crack open Facebook and I start flipping through it and listening to what everybody's got to say, all that's ultimately doing is training my mind to be, be distracted. All that's ultimately doing is wiring my brain in such a way that I can't focus to communicate with somebody in a way that God had designed me to or to live life in the way that God had designed me to. This is why I need you to hear very closely that stillness before the Lord is Amen. important. Amen. I didn't talk about going before the Lord and telling him all your problems. I'm not even talking about picking the book open and reading it. I'm not talking about watching a Christian video or listening to a Christian song. I'm talking about keeping your mouth shut while the theta and the alpha waves are still flowing and getting in his presence. I'm talking about the very minute your eyes open. Sit up, shut your mouth, and listen. And I'm telling you, you're in a visionary state already. You just came out of a sleep. It's already actively happening. It's already there. If you leave the phone on the nightstand, you leave the Bible on the nightstand. Even. You leave everything on the nightstand and you sit up. No words, and you go before Christ and you fix your mind on Him still and silent. Theta waves and alpha waves are still active, and God is able to deposit in you a vision that you're Amen. otherwise going to have a hard time tapping into. 
Amen. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Yes. You say, that's not reasonable. Some of you are going to get it. You're going to lie. It's going to be changed. The rest of it is like, that's stupid. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. Look, after you rise up and after you sit still and after the theta waves and the alpha waves begin to subside and you enter into beta waves and all that sort of thing again back into your normal day to day, then pick the book up, get in there, see what it's got to say. Get in there and start listening to worship music. That's fine. But the first thing you do while those waves are still in the place they need to be in is get still and know that he is God. Amen. How many of you actually practiced that? First thing, you get up, no words, straight into the presence of God. You're going to want to do this. Let me tell you something. Once you're in Christ, your mind is ultimately the very bottom line uh, that the outcomes of your life are built upon. This is the facts. Your health, your relationships, your income, uh, your, your, you name it, whatever the, whatever the case might be, is the direct result of what you've employed your mind to believe. Now, when you're training for a sport, how much of that training is actually mental? When the fighter goes to the ring, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, I've got to get psyched about it? They're just talking about their psyche, their mindset. They've got to get their mind right is what they're saying. They understand that it's a lot more than the physical aspect of the sport or the fight. Uh, what they're saying is they've got to get their mind in order before they're able to do what it is that their job or their sport is going to require of them. You see, most people know what to do, but do they do what they know? Most people know what to do, but do they do what they know? I've heard it said that knowledge is power, and that's simply not true. Knowledge is only power when you put it into practice what you know. Amen. Knowledge in and of itself is not power. It's only power when you put it into practice. And I'm here tonight to give you a few very simple things that will give you knowledge that as you put them into practice, you will find power. And I guarantee you that if you employ these things, your life will change. In ministry, it's no different. In your family, it's no different. In your finances, it's no different. Without a vision, the people perish. Folks, I'm telling you, a vision is a picture of the future that produces a passion. I want you to think about it. Why do you suppose Jesus spoke in the way that he did? Why do you suppose Jesus said, John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Why do you think Jesus spoke like that? Because he knew that it would implant a vision of something greater to come in the minds of his people that would allow for his people to press on with a passion. Amen. You cannot undermine the value of a vision. You cannot uh, overlook the importance of a vision. I'm telling you, when you first wake up, you're already in a relaxed state of awareness. If the first thing you do is grab your phone, you're, you're training your mind to become reactive. I'm telling you, what happens when you get on there and somebody's contrary to what you think? Or you get on there and you got a text message and somebody's giving you bad news. What happens is if that's the first thing you see when theta and alpha waves are still flowing because you just got out of bed? I'm telling you, what you're doing is you're allowing the influences of the world to come into your spiritual faculties and form your spiritual life for you. What you're doing is you're ultimately opening the veil to the holy place and saying, come on in and, and twist whatever you want to twist and harm whatever you want to harm. It's our responsibility to understand that as this is the temple of God, it functions in a certain way. It does not immediately move into beta waves. It just doesn't. You're still, for a short moment, still in that visionary state. And if you rise rather than go to Facebook or Instagram or text messages or music or flipping through Google or whatever else you can do, and you rise and you, you go still before the Lord and you rest in his presence, God will begin to deposit in you a vision. Amen. Why do you need a vision? Because without a vision, the people perish. I'm telling you, if you want to glorify Christ, if you don't want to live your life broke, if you want to see better outcomes with your relationships, then start in a stillness before the Lord while your brain is still in the position of visionary. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? 
Can you play very gently? Something? Because what this does is it forces your mind to back away from beta waves and enter into close proximity of theta waves. So as he plays gently, and you're actually listening to what I'm saying and receiving it, then I bet you retain more of what I'm telling you. You're saying, this guy's too scientific. Is he a heretic? <laughs> You believe what you want to. I'm telling you right now, man, this will change you. This will change you. We sit around like like mannequins hoping God will drop something on us if it's according to his divine will. And then we sit around and nothing ever changes. Not understanding that we're the temple of God. God's given us his word and given us an understanding so that we can step into the greater and to the more and to the deeper and to the wider. He's got for you what he's got for me. He's got great things for you. we got to reach out and take it. We can't be ignorant of the devil's devices who would tell us that if God wants to, he will. If he don't want to, he won't. No, it's not God's will that any should what? Perish. But that all would come to repentance. Without a vision, the people what? It's not God's will that you don't have a vision then. Come <laughs> on, oh, man. If he said without a vision, you perish, and it's not his will that you should perish, but repent, then it's always his will that you have a vision of some sort and some matter. It's God's will. If you don't have a vision for your family, for your finances, for your church, then it's not because God don't have one for you. It's because you need to understand how this mind works. Capitalize on it. Take advantage of it. And go into the presence of God while you're already in. The pump is primed. Let him drop something in your heart. Do you see how much more palatable this information is while he's playing? The state of waves give you goosebumps and comfort. So this is what a vision does. It gives you direction to move in. It keeps you focused. It gives you purpose. It keeps you moving forward even when you feel stuck. I want to give you all an important fact. And I'll try and quit. Did you know that the screen of your device, your tablet, your phone, your MacBook, your your uh, HP, your Dell, I don't care what you got, your TV. Uh, it produces what they call a blue light. Did you know that that blue light on your device destroys melatonin levels? Which help you to relax, sleep, and enter into a visionary state. I want to challenge you for the rest of the month of July and honestly for the rest of your life to not look at another screen for the first and the last hour of the day and see what happens. For the first hour of your day, I challenge you, try your very best. Don't pick the phone up. First thing, right out of sleep, go straight into the presence of the Lord and be still. You may pray, you may read, or whatever else after that, but start with being still. It will change everything. It don't have to be a concrete hour, but I challenge you to try to Try to not touch a screen for an hour before in the morning and at night before you go to bed. Let those, uh, let that blue screen go. That blue light, let it go. So then when you're developing in these disciplines, um, I challenge you to write down, now listen to me, I'm giving you a challenge as a church because I want to say it's change. I'm not just here to give you good information and that's that. Point number one, obviously, is when you wake up, you open your eyes right out the gate, sit up so you don't fall asleep, and be still in the presence of the Lord. Don't turn the music on. Don't look at your screen to find a worship song. Don't go to reading or don't tell God what you're sorry about. None of that. Just be still. With your mind fixed on Him, put your mind with Jesus, fix your mind on Him, and then just be still. Start there. Um, I challenge you, point number two, to not even look at a screen. First hour of your day, last hour of your day. 
I challenge you, one way or another, try not to look at a screen. If you think it's not beneficial, I promise you, it's scientifically beneficial for your brain. And if it's scientifically beneficial for your brain, then by necessity, it's going to, it's going to help you spiritually in your mind. Uh, the third thing, though, I want to challenge you on this one. You'll have to think about it. Get with God. When you're being still, let Him deposit this vision so you'll know what this looks like. But uh, I want to challenge you to pick two spiritual goals. Two personal goals. And two professional goals. Because they're all important. Write them down at night so that when you go to face your day the next day, those goals are set before you like unto a vision even, a target that you can pursue and see if that doesn't set your life in a different pace and a different order. Without a vision, the people perish. I've said this to somebody the other day. I said, look, if there was a target 300 yards away, I didn't tell you where I put it. It's the size of a nickel. It's over there in the woods somewhere. What is the likelihood that you'll hit it if you fire over it to the woods? Not good. But if you had a vision that it was on that tree trunk that I'm looking at right now that's more than 300 yards away, and I had a rifle with the scope, good chance I'd hit it because I have a vision of where it is. My point is this. Two spiritual goals, two personal goals, two professional goals. So that you've got something to aim at. Because I promise you, as you're being still in the presence of the Lord every morning while the theta and alpha waves are still rolling, and you're still in His presence, God's going to begin to develop visions. You, you say, I, the first time I went, I didn't really catch a vision. That's fine. You won't necessarily get one every time you're still in the presence of the Lord. But I promise you this. Every time you're still in the presence of the Lord, it's doing something in your holy place that nothing else can it's, if nothing else, it's preparing you to receive vision. It's preparing you to be ready to catch vision when God decides to drop it in there. But I challenge you to do these few things. Do you all understand? Helen Keller. Do you all know who she is? Somebody asked her, is blindness the greatest human handicap? And without hesitation, she said, no. <laughs> it's worse to have eyes, seeing eyes, and not see. I want you to think about that. I got a lot more that I was going to say, but I just feel like it's quick time. When God's ready to quit and pray, then we just do what God wants to do, so... Y'all got the few basic points, things that you can practice that I promise you will change you. If you, if anybody missed any of the points, I'll throw them back out there one more time. But into it. When you first wake up, take advantage of the alpha and theta waves and get still before the Lord. No pit stops, straight into his presence. No hesitation, straight there in silence with your mind fixed on Jesus. That's point one. Next. Try not to touch a screen. First hour of the day, last hour of the day. I believe that's the most, two most important hours of your entire day. Why? Why the last hour? Because you're fixing to go into the alpha and theta waves that you're going to arise in. Don't take the blue screen with you. Don't take all of that mess with you, the Facebook, all that. Let it die before you go in. And then lastly, two professional goals, two spiritual goals, two personal goals. Write them down that evening and pursue them the next day. God will use these simple practices to change your life. Without a vision, the people perish. But if you're still in the presence of the Lord and you're practicing these focused type practices and you're trusting that God's going to change you, I guarantee you, He's going to develop vision in you and you're going to see life in a way that you never did before. Are we good?